Good afternoon and welcome. I am Joanna Arnold and I am delighted to welcome you to this discussion on the power of audience intelligence and its importance on PR and communication strategy. As we embark on a new era of AI technology driven innovation, the role of PR and communications professionals has become more pivotal than ever before. We are living in a world of fragmented audiences where consumers are increasingly discerning and demanding. Simply putting out a message and hoping it resonates is no longer enough. We have to be hyper targeted and speak directly to our audience's needs. This is where audience intelligence comes in. By understanding our audience on a deep, nuanced level, we can create communication strategies that truly resonate with them. But audience intelligence is not just about demographics and behaviours. It's about understanding the aspirations, fears and desires of our audiences. It's about understanding how each community talks and engages with a topic and synchronising our communication strategies with their languages and behaviours. As PR and communications professionals, we have the power to shape the conversation, drive change and plan data-led, audience-centric campaigns that stand out and prepare for any trends that could affect our company or brand. Today, we are privileged to have an esteemed panel of speakers who will be discussing the latest trends and best practices in AI-driven audience intelligence. Our panel includes Prashant, Head of Insights Asia at Icentia, who brings a wealth of experience working with some of the world's most iconic brands in the Asia region. Andrew, Assistant Professor at Nanyang Technological University, is a leading expert in the field of AI and communication and pro will provide us with his unique insights into how AI can be used to optimize communication strategy while still maintaining a human touch. Ram, Senior CMI Manager at Unilever, will share his expertise in crafting compelling narratives that speak directly to the audience's needs and interests. Jackie, Head of Corporate Communications at Light Rail Manila Corporation, who will provide valuable insights on developing and executing communication strategies. And lastly, we have Lady Ashell, Regional Insights Director Asia, who's a seasoned professional with a wealth of experience in audience intelligence. We are thrilled to have her as our moderator today. Today's discussion is just the beginning of a journey to understand your audience and crack the secret of how to create hyper-targeted campaigns. Throughout the series of episodes, we aim to create a community of like-minded professionals who are passionate about audience intelligence. So let us embark on this journey together. Let us learn from each other, share our experiences and push the boundaries of what's possible. Let us use the power of audience intelligence to build successful brand strategies and communication co campaigns that have real impact. Thank you for joining us today and I look forward to hearing your questions and feedback. Let's now begin the discussion. Good afternoon to all our communicators, public relations practitioners, change makers, and innovators across Asia. We are excited to have you with us this afternoon. As PR and communications professionals, we know that the media landscape is constantly evolving. We must stay on top of the latest trends to ensure our messages are heard. We must adapt and embrace new forms of media while being strategic and understanding the nuances of each platform. Finding the right balance between media and messages is critical at this point. We need to tailor our messages to fit the media our audience is using and creating messages that resonate with them and address their pain points. It's not enough anymore to just talk about what we want to say. We need to communicate effectively to our audience. Hence, audience intelligence. Now, the media landscape has undergone a significant shift in recent years with the emergence of new mainstream media and social media apps that presents both challenges and opportunity. Social media platforms have become the new mainstream media, especially for younger audiences, while traditional media outlets are no longer the only players in the ballgame. However, this fragmentation of media also presents a unique opportunity for us to reach a wider audience. TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram have arguably gone mainstream in recent years. With Gen Z as their most dominant users, we now have players like Twitch, Be Real, and Clubhouse, among many other platforms that challenge the media landscape of Asia and the rest of the world. Twitch 
if you, you don't know it yet, is a live streaming platform that has grown rapidly in recent years. And it now boasts over 140 million monthly users and have become hub, a hub for gaming content with users tuning in to watch their favorite gamers play, interact with other users, and even make donations to support their favorite streamers. Another example I mentioned is Be Real. It's a social media app that has recently launched and is quickly gaining popularity. It is a unique feature that allows users to post unedited, unfiltered content, which is definitely resonating with our Gen Z. Be Real has amassed over 1 million users, providing a safe space for users to connect and share their authentic selves with each other. And additionally, Clubhouse. It has emerged an audio-based social media app with exclusive audio rooms and events. And Clubhouse has actually created a new way for people to connect and engage with each other, making it a very popular choice among Gen Z. This fragmentation of the media landscape means that as PR and comms professionals, we need to adapt to the changing media environment and understand the new platform. We must create engaging content, build relationships with influencers and content creators who have massive following on these platforms. This requires us to be creative, take risks, and stay ahead of the curve. Now, messaging is a fundamental aspect of PR and comms. It allows us to connect with our audiences, communicate our stories, and build our brand. And in today's fast-paced world, businesses need to communicate with their audience in real time and provide customized experiences. Hence, the rise of generative AI has opened up new possibilities in messaging with chatbots and virtual assistants leading the way. Now, you have all heard chat GPT. It is at the forefront of this field. They utilize the power of natural language processing and machine learning to generate content that is persuasive, high quality, and resonates with audiences. Their PR releases and synthetic content are almost identical to human-generated content, and they're constantly pushing the boundaries of what AI-generated messaging can achieve. In addition to this, text-to-image revolution is further enhancing the potential of generative AI, and by using advanced algorithms and deep learning models, AI can now generate realistic images and videos based on textual, out, out, textual input. This technology can be used to create visually appealing content that resonates with our general public. Now, generative AI has a huge impact on PR and comms. It helps create personalized and effective messaging that resonates with our audiences. And to succeed in this field, professionals must embrace generative AI's possibilities and partner with the likes of, let's say, chat, GPT, for tailored messaging and achieve business objectives. With generative AI, we can create high-quality content that connects with our audience and drives our goals forward. Hence, after all of this, the focus now is on your audience with the media they follow and the messages they resonate with them as of utmost importance to PR professionals. Successful PR requires more than just understanding our audience. We must also comprehend the media they follow and the messages that resonate with them. As PR professionals, our first step is through insights, research, and audience intelligence. And we must identify our audience, the media they consume, and the messages that speak to them. Once we have this knowledge, we can tailor our messaging to the platform that our audience uses most. And for example, younger audiences may be more active on TikTok or Instagram, while professionals may prefer LinkedIn. By adjusting our content to the platform, we can create messages that speak directly to our audience. Icentia, as part of the Access Intelligence Group, we continue to innovate and challenge our peers in the profession and that to maintain every organization's competitive edge, audience intelligence for organizations is impactful and beneficial because this means you will be able to provide the most valuable solutions to your audience's biggest questions in formats they would like to consume. Allow us to share with you some game changers in the way audience, media, and data intelligence should be delivered and leveraged. Now, imagine how mapping trends and topics flow across social search and traditional media and uncovering its impact in shaping the perceptions of targeted audiences via own communication channels. The answer, our answer, narrative diffusion. This is a holistic measurement approach that looks at how trends and topics flow across social, Google search, and mainstream media. We first um, de deep delve into the insights we can offer for every type of data, such as how effective are your mainstream media narrative? Did your narrative resonate with your target audience on social? 
Are there any potential gaps in your communications efforts? And we can identify for you. And last but not least, who resonates the most with your narrative on social? Some of the key metrics of the measurement are sentiment, key topics, top media type, and media penetration, gap analysis across, again, mainstream, social, and top advocates and detractors. Some of the needs that we can address and the benefits our clients can reap from our narrative diffusion could be we can provide an understanding on any potential gaps across the media spaces, your own messages, and this in turn facilitates an accurate refocus for your published narrative. We also look into audience insights that you can tailor your messages and allow you to better resonate with your audience via a deep understanding on their demographics, psychographic, and behavioral traits on social media. Here are some of the outputs that you will see on screen. Now, imagine having the power to tailor your messaging to align with the values, tone, and audience of each digital media one's outlet you target. Our answer, media archetype. Our media archetypes analysis is designed based on the famous Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung's theory of archetypes that details 12 universal patterns of behavior and personality that exist within the human psyche. News media, like any industry, reflects and adapts to the archetypes of its audience to stay relevant. For example, CNA media's archetype can be mostly described as a sage, which displays traits of wisdom, intelligence, expertise, information, and influence. And this is usually attributed to information and groundbreaking news that the media shares, whereas, let's say, Mothership Singapore's media archetype is usually described as every man due to its focus on human interest news. Our media archetypes methodologies will help PR professionals understand the archetypes of news media to effectively communicate specific narratives to the target audience. Imagine now having to be able to know that what drives your reputation among your peers, competitors, and target audiences? Our answer, reputation intelligence. Our reputation intelligence facilitates this need to go deeper than surface level conversations, moving beyond volume and sentiment with meaningfully structured data sets tied to business objectives. Our reputation intelligence addresses the needs from clients and the benefits they can reap is to need to dig deeper to surface key perception drivers that explain how brand reputation is being constructed and enact change with measurable impact to understand why changes have occurred by interrogating unprompted data sets of the most valuable conversations, leveraging the opportunity to make positive impact. We also need for a real time, always on tracker for reputation related brand conversations that exist harmoniously alongside existing measurement framework, let's say for sample survey. It also has the benefit for the need to quantify reputational threats by audience and protect against future negative impact on brand perceptions. Fundamentally, the reputation intelligence framework adds structure to noisy brand data sets by utilizing a custom approach to cluster your conversations into core pillars that represent key themes driving perceptions of reputation. Last but not the least, imagine having to be able to map stakeholders to your business and be able to manage and assess their position about you in the industry. Our answer, stakeholder mapping. Generally, stakeholder mapping is a technique used in business to project and project management to identify and categorize the different groups or individuals who have an interest or will be affected by a project or negative or, or initiative. The purpose of our stakeholder mapping is definitely to help businesses and organizations understand the various stakeholders' concerns, priorities, and expectations, and to develop strategy to engage and manage those stakeholders effectively. Fundamentally, by understanding the needs and expectations of key stakeholders, businesses can develop more effective strategies to manage their relationships and maximize their impact. In short, audience intelligence and all the innovative products that you've seen helps you understand your audience better, which in turn allows you to develop more effective PR strategies. By knowing what your audience is interested in, what channels they prefer to consume information on, and what motivates them, you can create targeted and personalized campaigns that are more likely to resonate with them. As the media landscape evolves, we must keep up with the trends and leverage the new media sources to create successful campaigns and build meaningful connections with our target and potential audiences.
Now, that's a whole lot of information for you, but we're excited this afternoon. You're in for a treat with this upcoming webinar, which promises to be an exciting and informative event. You know, the world of public relations and communications is constantly evolving, and our panel of experts this afternoon will be sharing their insights, experiences, tips even on the latest in uncovering audience intelligence. But this isn't just any ordinary webinar. As you see, our panel of speakers are some of the most respective and innovative professionals in the field. And they'll be, they'll be bringing their A-game to this discussion. And you and our audience here this afternoon, you'll have the opportunity to ask them front and center, ask the questions and take a jab and engage in our lively discussion with our, your peers. Um, so let's get ready to be engaged, inspired, and informed as this webinar is going to be a game changer for PR and comms professionals. Perhaps let's go around the table and give our panelists a chance to share a quick word or two on how excited you are for today's discussion. And let's kick off with one question, your initial thoughts on audience intelligence. Let's begin with you, Prashant. Hi, everyone. My name is Prashant. I look after insights for Asia, uh, for Isanthia in the Asia region. We work with about 1,000 plus clients, helping them, consulting them with brand and reputation. I'm very excited to be part of this and we'll talk a lot about audience intelligence, which is all about focusing on your audience, whether it's through the right mediums or through the right messages. Looking forward to be part of this panel. Thank you, Prashant. Now let's go over to Jackie. Oh, uh, Jackie, your initial thoughts on audience intelligence. Hello, good day to everyone. I am Jackie Gorospe. I am from Light Rail Manila Corporation. So we are the private operator of the first light rail system in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia. So now that given the nature of our industry, we're in, we are always, the public is always watching, um, you know, in terms of how we perform. So it's definitely very important that we know what our audience is saying. All right, thanks, Jackie. Now over to Ram. Ram, um, very exciting times ahead, right? So what are your thoughts on audience intelligence? Yep, thank you, uh, Lady Ashel. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Ram, uh, and I work in the Consumer and Market Insights team at Unilever. Um, as a CPG uh, company, our core business is built on a foundation of understanding our consumers' needs. Uh, so both in terms of understanding what are the needs from the categories that we play in, so in terms of innovation ideas or what are some of the unmet needs that we should be doing, competitor monitoring, understanding trends in culture. Uh, there's just a whole um, array of topics where audience intelligence plays a role. Uh, and that's pretty much the foundation on which our business is built. Uh, and, I, and I think that any company's competitiveness is solely based on the data that it collects about its consumers. And I think that's where uh, we see its, its, its importance. Very insightful there, Ram, from the term itself, competitiveness. We'll discuss about competitive edge this afternoon. And over to you, uh, Andrew, initial thoughts on, on audience intelligence. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Prawl. I'm an assistant professor here at the Lee Kim Lee School of Communication and Information at Nanyang Technological University here in Singapore. Uh, I do have a background, almost 10 years worked in uh, public relations and advertising, but for now for the past 10 years, uh, I've been uh, obviously in academia. So I want to try and approach this at least from, from sort of a scholarly perspective. And I can say that there is hardly any uh, majorly and widely used theory of persuasion or public relations that doesn't have as a prerequisite understanding your audience, what their current attitudes, beliefs, uh, and values are. That's essentially the first part of many uh, models uh, that we typically use when we study uh, public relations and, and persuasion. Um, so any way we can do that better is great. And also just on AI, always excited to talk about AI. That's my research area. All right. So glad to have that energy with us, um, Andrew. Perhaps we'll look into uh, the first a series of questions that we'd like to discuss for, for, for you, our experts here, and all of our audiences, understanding really your target audiences or the target audiences of your organizations. We'll probably need to ask the question, what is audience intelligence and why is it now a must-know and not just a nice-to-have for organizations, especially in the age of AI? I'll begin with you, Prashant. Thanks, Ochel. So, Audience is not a new term, right? And consumers, audiences, tribes, groups, communities, it's not new. 
but it's coming back into the forefront because of just the sort of burst that we have seen in messages and mediums. So what you were talking about before in the starting part of the webinar, it's all about that how mediums are getting fragmented. Uh, you would see mediums also changing their role, especially after Twitter's acquisition, you would see that various mediums are trying to align back to the audiences and the relationship between audiences and medium is changing. You throw in Web3, decentralized media, and then the whole gamut and the game changes because it starts to get decentralized, content starts to get owned by the creator itself. So mediums are changing. Now let's mix in generative AI with it. And you would see that there's a burst of synthetic content, which is all your text to images, text to videos, text to text. And you would see that there is a sort of an explosion in terms of how messages have come about. And we as marketeers, communicators, are also trying to understand that how do we use the messages to not just have a sort of a blinding or a deafening eye to it, but it's more around that how do we really tailor those messages back to our audience. So mediums are expanding, messages are becoming synthetic, and both are going on. And hence, we need to cut through this clutter to go back to the audiences we care about, the communities within these audiences, and then go back to square one to really have a proper communication with the audiences. Thank you, Prashant. That was a, a, a lot to unpack. And I'm sure our, our audiences are learning so much from um, audience intelligence early in this uh, discussion. Probably I'll, I'll, I'll touch base with Andrew coming from the from the um, academic side of, of, of things vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the rest of the practitioners, practitioners here. Why do you think, Andrew, is it now a must-know for um, students in the academy and young professionals and not just a knife to have for organization? Audience intelligence in the age of AI first. Great. Well, there's a couple angles uh, I'll take on this. So the, the first one, just in terms of why should young professionals, or I think any professional, be really proficient and know as much as they can about their audience? Well, the first thing is that, and I'm sure we'll touch on this later today, and you touched on it in your in your in your introduction, that new AI tools give us the ability to personalize messages even more than before. You know, even down to the individual level. Um, and so as a result, the more that you know about people, uh, the better off you're going to be. So obviously, uh, audience intelligence is going to be important in that endeavor. But kind of looking a little bit more forward, which is one of the one of the kind of benefits of, of being a researcher, I think that that one risk uh, that a lot of uh, companies and organizations are not understanding right now is that AI is not only a producer of content, it is going to be a consumer of content. In other words, AI is part of the audience of your message. There's a lot of like influencers who are quite open about how they've how they've actually automated a large part about what they do, their social media postings and whatnot. So being able, I think, going forward in order to separate to know, OK, what is it that that humans uh, are consuming and what narratives are they spreading and which ones are actually being sort of picked up by essentially bots out there and being spread by bots? Because those messages and those narratives could be different. Being able to discern those two, I think, is very important. And obviously, audience intelligence could help in that. Um, so that's kind of you know, trying to trying to trying to look forward a little bit. I, I'm curious to see what anybody else thinks of that, but that's a future I think that is very possible. Oh, thank you for that, Andrew. Now, I'll probably touch base with Jackie because she's leading a a really uh, big organization here in the Philippines. So, Jackie, how coming from uh, Prashant and Andrew's points, how has your organization actually integrated audience intelligence into your PR strategy? And perhaps another question would be, what specific outcomes have been achieved, or at least aiming to achieve at this point? So I mentioned in my introduction earlier that due to the nature of our business as a public utility in mass transportation um, and also being part of service industries, uh, wherein you rely not in the sale of material products and goods, but the delivery of service is very much a part of how your company performs in the minds of your target audience. So definitely in this process, feedback, is a critical component. And we know that in the delivery of these services, feedback from our target audience is very important. So in the case of LRMC or you know, LRT1, audience intelligence is very important in helping us you know, maintain uh, the reputation, the desired reputation, and at the same time, deliver effective communications to our partners. 
in support of our business objectives. Because at the end of the day, we are a private operator, we are a business organization. So we need to make sure that our communications will be effective. And in our case, um, one, in terms of crisis, it helps us monitor how you know, things develop and uh, perhaps take a preventive approach so that we ensure a positive reputation for our company. Second, on the marketing side of things, uh, when we are able to study how our audience is responding to the stories, to the content that we put out there, it helps us understand how, what else we can do. Uh, number one, see what is the outcome of the content uh, that we are pushing, the media partners that we are engaging. At the same time, spot promising spaces for our company in the same way that are there new social media channels where we should be present or do more of you know, activities? Number two, are there certain topics and interests that our audience, the LRT1 passengers and commuters, are finding uh, more interesting aside from the basic news of providing LRT1 service advisory? So things like that. It helps us uh, become more... Um, impact driven and uh, you know be also more outcome oriented rather than just output no? keep doing things but at the end of the day you really don't know if you are being effective at what you do uh, that's really very insightful I think that what I picked up from what Jackie mentioned is the word impact and all we are professionals and communicators in general we aspire to provide impact to our target audiences and even to our stakeholders. Ram, on your experience as part of a big organization such as Unilever, how does the organization balance, let's say, the use of AI-generated insights with the need for human expertise and creativity in your, um, if, if not PR, marketing, or even communication efforts in general? Um, I think um, uh, the way we've always, I think, thought of AI is, is, is almost like augmented intelligence. So it kind of augments human intelligence. Um, and uh, that's the way we see it. So, so it's an amplifier for human creativity and for human insights, et cetera. Um, what it definitely does is improve the processes in terms of efficiency. Um, it is getting much better also in terms of effectiveness. But I think in terms of making sure that the right kind of content is being created, the kind, right kind of insights have been identified, there is still a very much of a human angle that's that's needed. Um, uh, Prashant did mention about you know, the fragmentation of media. Uh, one result of that is just the proliferation and the amount of content you know, brands need to put out today. Um, I think I was reading a, a research paper from a while, back. this was nearly two years ago, where they were saying that on an average for a new innovation today, it requires 30,000 pieces of content for it to you know, see through and land on different platforms and different you know, uh, mediums, et cetera. Now, we will never be able to create that kind of content you know, just with you know, humans. And therefore, there is a process uh, and, and efficiency that can be driven with AI, uh, but then making sure that, that we are guard railing the process in a way that it is impactful, that it's tapping into the right uh, audience needs and the, and the right kind of tensions that have been identified, that's where the human intelligence has to come in. And I think it's a... Yeah, and the way we have to always think about it is as augmented intelligence. So it's augmenting human intelligence and it's not replacing it. Uh, that's actually a, a, a spot on Ram. Prashant, probably to, to leverage on what um, Ram mentioned, as us here in Isentia, right? Who do, you, who, who do you think should be an organization's target audience and what should be the characteristics and behaviors? Yeah, I would look at it as... Uh sort of three concentric circles, one within each other. So your core part becomes your current targets or current consumers. Um, the second one becomes more of uh, lapses. People used to try, but have for some reason are not trying your brand or not, or not taking your services. And the third one is essentially the prospective customers, the big wide world out there and how your brand really goes back and relates to them. So coming back to the whole point around AI and audience intelligence, you can really use AI in two different manners, I would say. So let's talk about the pre-DALI, pre-chat GPT days. This was all about interpretive AI, right? So you look at the large volumes of data, uh, whether it's text, image, video, speech, and then you can really extract entities, you can really extract what people are talking about, 
and really understand data at large scales. That's what was the genesis of data science. Now, post DALI, DALI, the product from OpenAI, post DALI, it has become more generative in nature. So now it's not the interpretive has gone away. It's still there. You can still understand large volumes of data for these three concentric circles, your consumers, lapses, prospectives. But you can also tailor your messages to Andrew's point before. You can hyper-personalize it. So it's not just about insight sitting in a report with large data sets, but it's also actions that can now be taken, which was in a wish list. Personalization was kind of a word that would sit in a recommendation, but then when it comes to activation, it's tough, it's hard. And with generate AI, you can do that because it's all about that. Even if you look at, if you guys are watching this trend of Wes Anderson, the famous uh, filmmaker, right? And then everybody is looking at it from a different perspective. Wes Anderson from Ministry of Health, Wes Anderson from this consumer. One lens, one personalization, but way different sort of approaches towards your consumers, lapses, and prospects. So there's a lot of exciting world going out there and interpretive AI and generative AI will work together for that age of personalization. Totally agree. But perhaps well, the brewing question in our audiences right now, listening into this webinar, watching us having this discussion is, they are practitioners, they're PR practitioners. Basic question would be, what data sources should I therefore look into? And what are uh, data sources that are available so that I may be able to gain insights into audience intelligence? Is this it? social media? Is this customer feedback? What else is there? What's available there? Perhaps, Andrew, in, in the academe and academic side of things, what how do we how do we answer this question? Well, at least from a research perspective, at least in academia, we're actually limited in the number of uh, resources that that we look at simply because we need them to, to reach a certain level of validity and reliability. Um, but one one thing I, I want to mention when it comes to data sources, and I, I know that this was something that we intended to talk about today, but this brings in and I think it's it's not talked about enough right now. When you're talking about your data sources, there are ethical concerns that are raised. Um, and I think that this is a question that every practitioner should be asking themselves right now. Because um, remember, there's there's uh, there's not only a problem with, say, using too much data or data that perhaps you shouldn't be using, but there's also a risk in using too little data. In other words, your products, if you're marketing, say, financial products, right, there may be a vulnerable group of people that you don't want to market to, um, you know, and, and message. And there's a risk that actually if you start excluding too much data, you won't pick up on those people who may be in a, in a, in a vulnerable position. So I know I just opened up a whole can of forms of, of ethics here, but I think this is something that, that should be inherent in any conversation about data sources. I totally agree. Ensuring data privacy and you know ethical considerations would be part of this discussion. And now that we have touched base on it, what do you think are the key challenges and also opportunities in using AI for audience intelligence, such as data privacy, accuracy? Um, I think um, Andrew mentioned ethical consideration, but there's also the bias in terms of data. In, in Unilever, Ram, what do you think are the key challenges and even opportunities in using AI? And I think, uh, I mean, all of these challenges do exist. And I think uh, over time, I, I think firstly, being cognizant that these challenges exist is already a, a significant first step. So so knowing that there is bias in the data, there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, essentially it's, it's been trained on you know past data and and obviously culture evolves and i think culture is a is a critical point in terms of you know what was there in the past is probably not um you know culturally uh, uh you know right today right and, and 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 therefore you know the use of certain kinds of language you know use of certain kinds of um terminologies to to talk about certain groups of people etc obviously that keeps evolving as as kind of culture evolves so so being cognizant of the need to ensure that some of those things are ring fenced. Um, and I think that's where the human uh, aspect of it comes into. Um, in many ways, uh, you know, AI could be used to, I guess, collate a lot of information and make it, you know, readily accessible, you know, summarize it, etc. But the final, I think, view on, you know, what does it mean for us and where should it be featured and how it would be used is where the human uh, interaction would definitely need to come in. 
um, I, I totally agree with you, uh, Ram. Now, while the organizational level and still within the data privacy and ethical considerations on topic, Jackie, how does LRMC or your organization ensure the accuracy and ethical use of audience intelligence data in, let's say, your PR campaigns? Is this a challenge? Is this a brewing uh, challenge um, at the moment? So first and foremost, it's very important that your company has a data privacy policy in place and you have uh, your guardian to uh, lead the oversight for this function. And then in terms of audience intelligence, well, it's all about collecting various data points. Um, and you don't necessarily have to divulge the identity of a person or a customer but it's more of making sense of various data collect data points and interpreting what all of these pieces of information mean to you and how they can be translated to action. So for us in LRMC, we're able to follow the policy in place. At the same time, uh, we try to make sure that when we report or try to uh, make sense of data points, uh, that you know it's anonymized data and it's all about we look at trends uh what is the headline in terms of all these various data points so i think in that way we're able to uh protect the identity or the privacy of our uh, you know the sources of our data all right that's that's very good to hear and i'm sure our audiences here will learn from the expertise of LRMC. Now, a few steps backward, but more on the leveraging AI for effective communication. As stakeholders um, of all our organizations here, how do you think can PR professionals work with, let's say, other departments and stakeholders such as marketing, customer service, product development, to actually leverage on audience intelligence and improve communication and engagement with the audience? I'll probably begin with Prashad based as, as stakeholders and uh, the way we also communicate with our clients. How do you think can PR professionals work with other departments leveraging on our topic today? Yeah, and if I may, I would add internal as well as external stakeholders. Agreed. Uh, so, so, so let's take an example. Let's take an industry and let's uh, look into sort of who are the external stakeholders slash groups that you are influencing and working with as well as internal stakeholders and uh, departments uh, which are working towards a particular goal. So in terms of external stakeholders, it's a lot about really listening to them uh, on an ongoing basis. And what you can do is you can use different kinds of tools available out there to really listen to what they have been saying, not just in terms of what they're tweeting and what they are talking about, but what's the overarching narrative that that particular stakeholder group is talking about. For example, if you look at something like an oil and gas, there are different sides of the coin, right? One is the whole ESG uh, conversation, but there's also conversation about small businesses and how we need to sort of speed things up in climate change or sort of take a step back to cater to different kinds of stakeholder groups that we are talking about. So from that perspective, it's a lot about how those narratives are evolving in stakeholder groups and really how can an organization manage it. And it's especially challenging for organizations that are in the middle of very controversial uh, topics, AI being another controversial topic, right? As in, is it going to take away our jobs or is it going to make us the next Iron Man? So, 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 so those are more towards the external stakeholder groups and listening to their evolving narratives. Now, when we talk about the internal stakeholder groups, it's a lot about going back to the audiences and then how audience needs to be the lens through which everybody looks at how their work evolves uh, and which is all about just the collaboration part. So, and I think that the data is the one which makes, uh, which uh, differentiates the wheat from the chaff. Because if you're looking at the right audience communities, let's not talk about audiences as a sort of a monolith, but a sort of small communities coming together based on psychographics, demographics, and behavior. And how those, how we are trying to go after and have a conversation with those communities is the steps that PR professionals, marketers, operations, supply chain, and new product development needs to sync all together to craft campaigns and bring new products and services to market. Awesome. Ram, you also work with different departments, most likely for a big company like uh, Unilever. Any thoughts on, on, this, on this topic? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, finally, the, 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 the thing that is external facing from any organization or, you know, like, like 
So a company like Unilever and Brands is essentially its communication, right? So the advertising that we put out, the content that we put out, that's what is then actually consumer facing. Everything else is internal. So, you know, when we test, you know, early innovation ideas, for example, it's still a very internal conversation. When we are looking at supply chain and we're looking at some of the other considerations, it's all very internal. Uh, but the reality and, and the rubber hits the road when, you know, you actually put a piece of content out there. Um, and therefore, everything that you've done I don't know, for however long that innovation journey was, you know, sometimes it's 12 months from idea to actual, you know, creating the product to actually launch, that entire cycle kind of, you know, the, the reality kind of strikes when you actually launch it and the, and the and, and people externally start to actually see that piece of content. And, and therefore, the, the, I think the, the key responsibility is to ensure that throughout that process, which can be quite long drawn, how do you maintain the consistency of what is it that you're trying to do? Um, and therefore, you know, the impact is seen when you actually make it external facing. Um, and, and in many times, you know, it's almost like, like I sometimes think about you know, the amount of effort that goes in to just create a 15 second ad, because finally what someone sees is a 15 second ad on, you know, YouTube or, or wherever they see. But there's probably a 12 month journey and, uh, you know, uh, resources that have gone into just, you know, creating that. So, so, so to make that 15 second ad effective, you know, you need to have kind of ring fenced your entire journey um, so that the final, you know, output is in line with what you're trying to achieve. I'm picking up from Ram's brain here. Another word is consistency. You know, we mentioned earlier impact and consistency. And coming from from those terms, we want to touch base. Um, as we as we know, as we go along this uh, panel discussion, measurements, right? PR practitioners, communicators. At the end of the day, we want to measure how effective our campaigns are, how effective our our projects are. And this is very much uh, very happening in in all our organizations. Perhaps, um, Andrew, on an academic level or even a post-academic level, how can PR professionals measure the effectiveness of their audience intelligence efforts in with the different metrics that are available for everyone today? Well, the first question of, is, of course, what do you want to measure, right? You know, there's different terms of, of, of effectiveness. Now, uh, I, I can speak actually a little bit for our organization right here in terms how, of how we measure our effectiveness in terms of what we do uh, as, a, as an educational institution. Now, uh, we produce our, our biggest contribution, in other words, to the world. What we communicate to the world is the students that we're producing, actually. What are we teaching them? Right. And what are they how are they getting placed? And furthermore, uh, we have a really extensive internship program uh, here uh, in which we we send all, every student at we can we actually goes for an entire six month uh, professional internship with a company locally here. Part of that uh, experience is actually that a faculty member will actually go and meet with the employer, so to speak, of this of this uh, of this intern. And we ask them, what are you looking for next year? Essentially, what do you want us to teach people? So the reason I bring this up, the reason I bring this up is because this is very much an individual one on one old school style way of thinking about, you know, intelligence of if, if, if I'm assuming that my audience here is employers, right, potential employers, this is very old school. I think what's really interesting going forward is, you know, you mentioned some of these things in your introduction that, and, and Ram was kind of touching on this as well, you know, what is machine intelligence, right? What is, what is artificial intelligence? What is human intelligence? What makes things what, you know, I think that going forward, uh, new technology platforms are going to make it possible to, to gain equivalent insight that you may get from one of these face-to-face -face meetings. Of course, there's always going to be some differences, right? But I, I believe that this is the real challenge going forward is to, in, in order to use the, these new capabilities of, of tech, especially, where, you know, we're talking about generative AI right now, but to use this thing to get as much of that sort of old school intelligence that was always thought to be beyond uh, the capability of machines. How can we work that into our organizations, right? How can we essentially automate uh, that process? I am a big believer uh, in tech, and I believe that that will be possible going forward. However, I'm not a designer of these systems, so I don't know exactly how, but it certainly seems possible. Uh, obviously, we've seen how these systems have completely blown away just about everybody that's used them in terms of their capabilities. So that's the way I think about, uh, you know, how you how you're using the info that you're getting. Yeah. Um, definitely good points there, there, uh, Andrew. Jackie, more on measurement since you are on on in an in a organization that definitely would want to measure your campaigns. Your thoughts on measurement measuring effectively audience intelligence? 
Our youth intelligence helps us stay grounded and provides the checkpoint on how well we are performing in terms of achieving our vision and fulfilling our mission as a company. So as a private operator of LRT1 or public uh, the railway system, uh, we need to always check if we are doing our part in upgrading the transport system, at least in the minds of our customers and also our media as part of our stakeholders. So we need to see um, how well our efforts, how are they receiving, are they, are they actually effective in terms of shaping public opinion? What is the feedback of our audience in terms of the experience of our railway service? And also at the end of the day, um, we need to measure our effectiveness as communicators. Um, part of my actually department's targets every year is that we're very conscious in terms of the volume of um, stories, content that we put out there, whether it's on traditional or digital media. And at the same time, what kind of sentiments uh, you know, these contents are, you know, bringing to the company. So it's not just about volume, but are these um, types of content bringing positive sentiments? Are audiences uh, feeling more positive towards the brand or are they seeing us in a better light compared to the previous years? So overall, um, it helps us stay grounded and uh, focus in terms of working towards our company's vision. Thank you for sharing that, Jack. Before we all go into the Q&A and the questions from our, you know, a, a diverse audiences, probably I'll wrap this panel discussion with one question. What are the best practices and emerging trends in using AI for audience intelligence in PR? And how can organizations stay up to date with the latest developments in this field? Prashant? So I would start with just understanding trends out there. Because as we are focused on different audiences and communities within, it's about understanding what are the trends that are happening in those communities, whether it's product services or just conversational trends that are happening. That's step number one. Step number two would be to really align the next campaign that we are doing or the next key message that we are passing on to our audience uh, with those trends. Because then you are in sync with what is the cultural zeitgeist that's happening around Step number three is all about really, as your campaign is launched, uh, do a quick dipstick to understand how is it going. Don't make an assumption that you have you are suddenly now in the center of the conversation, but do a quick dipstick to really understand how the campaign is performing. Change the message, tweak the message, or change the budget in terms of which media you are spending on so that you're better aligned. And then finally, continue to do it as your campaign runs and does do a post-campaign evaluation. So finally, what does it boil down to? It boils down to how does it impact your brand or how does it impact your larger reputation? And that's about really measuring them on, I would say, a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on your industry, and then seeing how does that move the needle with the audiences that you're focusing on. All right. So thank you for that, Prashant. And I hope our audience has found all the insights here, informative, engaging so far. Now it's the time to put your questions to our expert panel, whether you have a specific question about one of the topics we've covered in the web webinar, our panel is definitely here to help. We've received some uh, very great questions already, but there's still plenty of time to get your own questions uh, in. So simply put your questions into the Q&A box to ask your questions live. So first question from Muhammad Fairuz Mod Amir, considering that some of the comments, reactions in social media and digital media may be claimed by bots um, and increasingly more difficult to discern due to AI, how accurate would be audience intelligence reports in the future? Probably something Andrew can answer. Uh, well, to be honest with you, I actually don't know how accurate uh, they'll be. I can only say one thing, that going forward, we know that technology will continue to improve. And so therefore, detection, I believe, will get harder and harder and harder and harder. Even right now, something, a very simple uh, objective in terms of detecting if a student, for example, has used ChatGPT in order to write their paper, we're talking about AI plagiarism. That's a pretty simple mission, actually. And the tools that are available to us right now as educators, and don't tell your kids if they're in school right now, you got to tell them that these, these tools are 100% accurate, don't plagiarize with AI. In reality, they are extraordinarily unreliable. 
And it's only going to get harder going forward. So I don't really know what the capabilities of the platforms will be going forward. I don't know if anyone else can chime in on this. No, no I think it's it's very much in line with what Andrew was saying. And, and I think that's where the the uh, you know the challenge comes back to the the processes in place in the organization to make sure that we are able to uh, and, and I know who used the term I think it was Prashant who said you know separate the wheat from the chaff right so uh, you, you, we need to be able to make sure that the processes that we have in place are able to weed out some of these challenges um, there is a narrative and or, or an increasing trend of diverse voices so there will be the diversity we will see in, in opinions and uh, you know thoughts and, and 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 what people are saying. Um, um, the question is, what is the implication of it? Um, which ones of it matter to what we do and therefore how we use it? And I think that's where, again, we'll keep coming back to the organization's uh, intentions, the organization's strategic priorities, and how do you actually use some of the um, information while they might be false or, you know, while they might be mixed with, you know, truth mixed with falsehood, how do you still uh, kind of do what is needed that's right for your business? Awesome. We have another question here. Um, with generative AI leveling the playing field in terms of content creation, how can this um, attendees campaign stand out in a sea of generative AI content and resonate genuinely with my audience? Any thoughts on this, Jackie? Okay, so actually related somehow to the previous question. So um, I think it's all about finding a balance between the use of AI-generated insights with the need for human expertise and creativity, especially at least I can speak for PR and branding efforts. Um, one way to discern how, you know, what will make you stand out is that you have a, um, a source of um, collection points, so different ways to really understand the audience. So all of these uh, data points will try to see if there is a pattern, some uh, a flow or a pattern in all of your data points, then you try to harness those and try to make sense. So you can't just simply copy or uh, take these pieces of information as they are and, uh, and act on them. So you have to consider value sources so that you make sure that you really stand out, to not just uh, really copy what others are doing or have a cookie cutter approach in terms of your campaign. So at the end of the day, it's all about knowing your audience and using a variety of sources for your data points. Prashant, you may want to add on this question. Thank you for that, Jackie, on generative yes. AI leveling the playing field. Yes, and I would also want to answer the first question that we had about bots. So uh, let's start with bots then. So if you're looking at the data, right, and you would see that uh, obviously as much as Twitter would claim and other media would claim that there are bots and with generative AI, the bots will only increase. In fact, even if you notice the kind of scam messages we all get, they are becoming sophisticated. So that's, an, that's sort of a signal towards the future. So if you look at bots, uh, it's all about, I'm going back to Andrew's point about are bots really bad or mm -hmm. are bots also the new bots, not the old bots? The new bots are they also can be used in terms of uh, some kind of an opportunity. So let's start with how do we sort of filter bots out and then take the good bots. So how do we filter bots out? If you look at social media, the most engaged, whether most liked, uh, commented, or shared comments uh, or the posts are the ones that do not are not seeded by bots. At least the bad bots or the bots that are long tail. Bots also don't end up uh, being in an echo chamber of a lot of communication coming together. Think of them as a network. They don't tend to form a network if there's a serious conversation going on. If they're just spamming, then yes, they would form a network. Now let's talk about the good bots. So let's say, uh, building on what Andrew said, let's say that we end up getting bots from brands. And these bots are sort of a, a alter ego of a brand. Think of Wendy's, think of McDonald's, but on steroids. So think of how uh, sort of sarcastic Wendy's is and then 10x in. Now, if that is a bot and that's claimed to be a bot and bot becomes this kind of a clippy, um, you know, we all smile, chat GPT is a new clippy, right? But there is a nostalgia to it. There's a brand to it. So if you think of these bots as the ones that are sort of having a humorous take and a personality of itself, then probably there is something out there in terms of not just taking them out, but they becoming a form of it. Because in the physical form, these bots are going to be sort of our helpers in future. Think uh, of Tesla's Optimus 
and all the other ones that are coming from Boston Scientific. So I think there's an opportunity in looking at a bot, but the bot that really helps. The second one would be, I'll make it very quick, just in the interest of time. Generative AI doing a level playing field and content creation, it's all about personalization. So again, going back to the points on the bot panelists said, it's all about hyper-personalized campaigns that would really go in. So if you don't like a movie, let's say the quantum mania bomb, the next 10 quantum manias will be made by the fans. And the, there'll be a level playing field on the content because we all can use our creativity now with the franchises that sure. we love. Awesome. We have several, actually many, many questions coming in. We'd love to answer them all, but in the interest of time, we'll definitely just uh, ask as much questions as we can, right? One question here says, what are the limitations of using generative AI for audience intelligence and how can they be addressed? Your thoughts on this, Andrew? Well, every time I talk about generative AI, I feel like the timeline on my comments is about 24 hours because tomorrow there's going to be some new tech that comes out and does something that I say right now it can't do. So I'll just be relatively general here, and I'll actually just return to the idea of basically machine or algorithmic intelligence versus human intelligence. And I, this is something that we talk about a lot uh, in my field, uh, and there's, there's people who've dedicated their entire careers in order to try and figure this out. Uh, I oftentimes think back to my days when I was working in advertising and I worked for a car uh, car brand, a major uh, car brand, one that isn't sold here in, in Singapore, oddly enough. Um, we talked about, well, what is it? What, what makes somebody buy a car, right? So if we think about that there's lists of features, there's things like horsepower, there's efficiency, how many you know uh, miles or kilometers you know per liter of petrol does it get? These are the types of insights that's very easy for machines, including generative AI, in order to understand. It's very easy to, for them to produce content that is consistent with somewhat of objective information like this. However, let's think about something that's also very important to humans, autonomy, right? There's something about having a car and the type of car that you have enables you to do different things. For example, you have a car in Malaysia. Is it capable of getting you to the trailhead in the Cameron Highlands, a notoriously bad road that's eaten up many, you know, tiny, compact front wheel drive cars, right? And I know this because I've been up there. I've seen plenty of cars stuck, right? It's not only about having a car, obviously, which affords you some autonomy. It's the type of car. It's the features that it has. How many kids can you carry around? How many cup holders does it have? Simple things like this. Now, it's simple for us, but that is almost impossible for a machine, including, I would argue, generative AI in order to understand and produce quality content on. It doesn't understand the human need for autonomy beyond just in a mathematical sense. People like to be able to travel far from their homes, for example, or get to work in a less amount of time. So I think that's the way to think about generative AI is more in terms of a general class of technology and what sort of intelligence it has and what sort of content it's good at producing. Thanks for that, Andrew. That's a lot to unpack, again, on limitations of using generative AI. I know we, we have a lot of questions and we don't have much time, but any member of our panel would like to answer that question as part of our wrap-up, limitations, and how can these be addressed? Based uh, Anyone else, Ra, want to add on to the discussion on limitations? Yeah, no, so, so so definitely what Andrew touched on is the element of, I, I guess, the, the nuances that, that generative AI is not able to touch into. But I think the, one of the other key aspects as well is it's still very much dependent on the prompting. And if I you know, take ChatGPT as an example, the output you get is only as good as the prompt you, you input. Um, if I change the prompt even slightly, it's still the same prompt, but I change it slightly, I see an output that's very different. So in, in many ways, the way I see it is, the more I'm able to prompt it with information I have, the output I get is a lot more relevant and tangible to use versus if it's a more generic prompt. And therefore, you know, the more we can, you know, also work on, uh, you know, making sure that the, the prompts going into generative AI are, 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 um, are, are informed prompts. They are not, you know, generic prompts. You know, the output is going to be that much more helpful uh, and, and useful uh, as well. Thanks for that. Probably just one more, last, last one more question. And this is very impactful for our audience here. This question goes, will communicators like us eventually lose human emotions if it's AI who's going to do bulk of the work? That's our last question for today. Probably, Prashant, you want to answer that first? Yeah, I'll give a short answer so that other panelists can chime in. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the ones who will lose the emotions would be the ones who will be giving uh, quite blah 
chat GPT prompt or some kind of generative AI prompts back to uh, Ram's point, because they will be ask, asking some obvious things and they'll get some obvious things back and there'll be a sameness of content. The ones who will have the emotions will stick back to the audiences and use AI with the right prompts, et cetera, to go really creative. Awesome. Um, Jackie? Um, definitely not, because we know that the people, at the end of the human interactions will still be very important. And your um, audience intelligence um, is just meant to make you more effective and not actually replace that. So it, it's supposed to make you more intelligent in dealing with your audience and also help you become more strategic. At the end of the day, you know, what you say is also as important as how you say it. So um, both ways, the content and the delivery. So definitely, um, you know, how you say it, the content is that also important and the human emotions should not be taken out of the equation. Thanks, Jackie. Probably, Ram, before I go to Andrew, just quick, quick answers. Are we as communicators going to lose our human emotions with audience intelligence and AI? No, I, I sincerely hope not. And I think the, I mean, the reality is that when there's just so much of content that's bombarding us, uh, I think the, 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 the critical aspect is that the only content that kind of cuts through that clutter is one that is emotionally engaging. So, so I could use AI to create, I don't know, 30,000 pieces of content, but there might be two out of that that actually cut through clutter and make an impact because they were more emotionally engaging. So the need to make sure that we tap into core human emotions in everything that we do, um, I think is, is essential to make sure that there is an effectiveness of the content that's, that's being put out there. Thanks, Ram. Now, last but not the least, Andrew, are we going to lose our energy, uh, such as in this webinar? No, I, I do not believe uh, that's partially what defines the human experience is the emotions that we have and what one of the things that separates us from machines, for example. Um, but there's actually something that we can talk about that would be research based here just to kind of finish it off. And I think that this is a concern that all organizations should have as they start to use AI or any sort of uh, new automated tools. Uh, and that is that there's a wealth of research and a variety of industries that shows that there is skill degradation uh, in when certain technologies are implemented. A really good example of this and one that I've written about before is in aviation. For example, there's a fair amount of pilots right now that have lost that real kind of, they call it stick and rudder, ability to fly the plane in difficult conditions. They over rely on automation. This is not a secret to anybody. There's tons of articles about there out there about this. So the question now becomes, actually, it's not how we're going to lose our emotions. Is it, do we risk losing our emotional intelligence if we actually say interact with machines too much, or we're using those machines in order to understand other human beings? I think that there is a risk of this, but I kind of want to end it on a positive note. And that is, you know, even if you ask somebody a futurist and you say, look 30 years into the future, what is the one thing machines will not be able to do? And they always say they will never understand our emotions, right? Machines are, are rational. They can't understand why somebody on a diet who's full, uh, who is is doesn't have a lot of time, walks past a new restaurant, they see a promo, and they just say, I'm going to try it. You know what I mean? They can never explain that sort of impulse, right? These random, unpredictable things that humans do, which are driven largely by emotion. So I think that even if uh, perhaps we lose a bit of our emotional intelligence, it will always come back to humans to understand other human emotions. So we'll always have that. So uh, I hope everyone keeps their energy high. Awesome. What a way to recap and wrap up this entire webinar. So to our audiences there, thank you for your questions. And as we've learned today, AI is transforming the way PR and communications professionals gather, analyze, and leverage on audience data. We've heard about our um, we've heard about ethical consideration from our speakers, how to leverage on content, leverage on our communication efforts, and definitely not losing this energy and human touch and human intelligence. We hope these insights will help you gain deeper understanding of your audiences and create more effective campaigns. Now, now, um, we'll be launching a poll for the, our audiences and a poll survey um, so that we'll be able to you know, do this better in the future. We will, you will also see um, a QR code on your screens as we promote our second episode um, on this webinar series from Icentia. 
and uh, our audiences um, who are here today, please, please join us on the second leg of this webinar series. This is a three-part series and you will definitely get certificates of attendance and participation for those of us who will join for the entire series. Again, thank you to our speakers, our panelists, our, the, the, our awesome panelists, Jackie, Andrew, Ram, and of course, Prashant, and Thank you for uh, trusting Isentia in this uh, webinar series. We hope to see you again. The replay of this webinar will be available to all of you shortly. And let's continue to learn and adapt our strategies to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-evolving PR and communication industry with audience intelligence in the age of AI. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.